Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. It's the week of the regular season starting, and we are here once again. I'm Dan alongside Matt to discuss the Calgary Flames and some interesting moves that have happened this week. Matt, how you doing? Excellent. Not looking forward to the, all the nice winter hockey weather in the beginning of October, but... There's snow do? on the ground. That's how you know it's hockey season. True. I wish how, it was like November, though. How would we have known otherwise if there wasn't snow on the ground? True. Well, we, uh, we're we coming off the training camp. We're 48 hours from the start of the season. And looking at um, the Flames and some of the moves they made, we'll get opening day rosters tomorrow from the Flames on Tuesday. But why don't we start by looking at some of the moves that the Calgary Flames made this week? Some of the shocking moves we saw over the weekend was a waiver move by the Flames. And usually waivers aren't that interesting, but Kulak, Peluso, and Lazar all put on waivers this weekend. Why don't we start with that? What are your thoughts there, Matt? Well, I wouldn't really say it was much of a shock. Uh, Kulak and Lazar were clearly passed by a whole bunch of players in pretty much all positions. So, And Peluso was kind of an unexpected one. I expected Peluso. I didn't necessarily think the other two guys would be put on waivers. Yeah. Well, you could see based on how both uh, Valimaki and Anderson played that Kulak's time in the NHL w- and even Dalton Prout played better, that it was not looking like it, he was going to be long for the organization. And Curtis Lazar, just it, frankly, he's like number 17 or 18 on the depth chart in my books, so... You only have 13, maybe 14 spots. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to have him in the press box when he could get first-line minutes in Stockton to hopefully put back together his game. Yeah, looking at all three of those guys, I knew as soon as they went up there they weren't going to get claimed. One thing fans often forget is that when you claim a player on waivers in the modern NHL, you have to keep them on your NHL roster for the year or they get optioned back to the original team. So I could see a team taking Kulak if he didn't have that rule, but nobody wants Kulak or Lazar as a, you know, must have all season. Exactly. Like there are, yeah, well, there's a couple of teams that lack a lot of depth, but those teams also can probably find players that are better than Kulak and Lazar on the waiver wire. If they're wanting to go that direction. Yeah, and even just to have the flexibility for those teams to say, hey, you know, hey, we might not want to carry this guy all year, that that really becomes a limitation. Mm-hmm. So all three of them cleared. I wasn't surprised about uh, Peluso, as we talked about. I was, I was assuming that Kulak would be left here as the number seven guy just to sort of give him some time in the NHL. I'm... I, I don't know that he's going to improve at all by going down to the AHL, and I think that that's really just a move of demotion because I think he's done pretty much all he can do there. And Lazar, I think you're right. I think he will probably be back here at some point this season, but he needs to go down and find his game, and it gives a good veteran guy for some of the young players to play with in Stockton, maybe even on that top line. Yep. And, you know, I think that Lazar, I mean, we paid a lot for him. I'm glad that he didn't get claimed because that's like giving away a free second rounder. And hopefully, I guess all I can really hope for is we can salvage something out of Curtis Lazar. Well, that's one of the reasons why I'm never a fan of trading draft picks pretty much ever, just because of the fact that typically when you're acquiring a player, it's not like it might help you in the short term, but it doesn't. It depletes your organization over the long term, and a lot of the trades that have been made lately with like guys like Elliott, Smith, Hamannick, Lazar, we we don't have a lot of draft picks and haven't for a while, and luckily we're in a situation where the team has a lot of young players on the NHL roster, but that you look at the Flames depth chart with both Dubé and Valimaki making the team to start the season that it's one of those situations where now the prospect depth chart is like Rasmus Anderson, Oliver Shillington, and then a whole lot of maybe if they put like several things together, they might develop into something type players. And that's just not very good. 
Well, I mean, you and I went to the rookie camp as we always do this year, and I'm just looking at the roster there. And I mean, we talked about this back in July, but this is probably the poorest roster as far as Flames prospects we've ever seen. Most of these guys, we had no idea who they were, and they'd brought in more bodies than usual just to fill out a camp. I know, and like it, it reminds me back when the Flames had the, their development camp, and like guys like Eric Nystrom, David Moss, and Dustin Boyd were the headliners. Uh, you know, not exactly a stellar group there, and it's starting to look that kind of way again, where the team's on the iffy side in terms of the future. So they need to definitely focus on both acquiring more draft picks and keeping the ones that they have. I don't, I'm not a hugely against selling draft picks for top end guys if you do it right. But yeah, I don't want to sell a draft pick for a guy like um, Lazar because that's sort of a crapshoot either way. But I think the Hamannick deal, the ha- the Hamilton deal, I don't like how many they gave up, but I'm okay giving up a certain amount of picks in those cases. <laughs> so after the waiver claim today, all three players claim- cleared waivers on Monday. We then found out that now that Kulak has been cleared through waivers, he got traded. And of course, who better to trade with than the Montreal Canadiens? And we can talk about them later, but I think they'll be a, a seller dweller. But we got a, a great value here, two for one. And Brett Kulak got sent to Montreal for Matt Tiramiter and Renat Valiv, who are both really AHL defensemen. Valiv is 23. And Teramina is 31. He's probably the new Dalton Proud of the AHL. Any thoughts on these guys, Matt? Well, I remember watching Taormina a long time ago when I was watching the Stockton games and that. And he was a dynamite offensive defenseman down for the farm team down there, the opposition. I can't remember which team it was back when he was playing. But uh, he's been one of the more consistently good offensive defensemen in the AHL but just is not a good enough player to play in the NHL. So he's just going to be the veteran leader guy, power play unit one type guy, and just a generally decent player overall. Uh, Renette Valiev, uh, he was included in the Thomas Placanitz trade, along with Kirby Reichel, um, oddly enough, last uh, trade deadline. And... I watched a little bit more of him just because of the Toronto Maple Leafs thing because there's more video and stuff available of that. And he's very much a similar player to Kulak, just a little bit more raw overall. But he's also a little younger, so... Uh, probably the same potential at the end of the day, but both are six seven type defensemen. Yeah, if you look at Taramina last year, he played for the Laval Rocket in the AHL, and he got, uh, in 63 games, he had 52 points. So four goals, 48 assists for 52 total. And the year before that, he played for the Syracuse Crunch, where he played 70 games, got 15 goals, 45 assists for 60 points. So bringing that kind of scoring to the AHL team, even if it's only on a, I think he's got a one-year deal, but even a guy like that, you know, an older guy, I think can still be a good part of that blue line. I'm not looking at either of these guys to ever jump to the NHL for the Flames, but I think that they're probably just good depth heat for Stockton or good depth defensemen for the Stockton Heat. What do you think? Yeah, well, I think that with all the tryout guys that the Flames had in camp, they were I think they were expecting one or two of them to be better than they ended up being, and I think that the Flames would have probably signed one or two of them, at least to an AHL contract if they had impressed at all and i think that was what led the flames to make this trade of getting a couple of decent veteran ahl defensemen so that way they have at least something in the tank for stockton because with guys like watherspoon leaving and others departing that there is a void down there and there's not really much left on the blue line for stockton yeah well as you and i talked about right it's um we don't have a lot of prospects. you got to find a place somewhere to, to get those prospects from. And sometimes it's just making these kind of trades to tide you over. So just looking at the contracts on both deals, both guys are on a $650,000 deal. Uh, Terramina is a UFA at the end of this year, and Valiv will be a RFA. So one of them will retain, one of them we won't. Um, I would imagine that they would uh, 
you know, retain Valley's rights after this, but we'll see. I don't imagine Terramina comes back after this season, but we'll find out. Oh. But overall, um, Brett Kulak, when he got sent there, he got did get sent to the HL. So Montreal probably wanted him to clear waivers first. They could send him down. What do you think is going to be Brett Kulak's potential in this league? Do you think he will become a regular NHL? Or he's 24 already. He's kind of closing in on that window to become that. Well, I think that he'll bounce around the league a bit and be that filler 6-7 guy. He has to, frankly, improve if he wants to be a consistent NHL player. And we haven't really seen him develop much at all for the last two years. And when you're basically being stagnant, like, you might have just hit your ceiling, and that's what you are, is that, like, slightly better than AHL, but not quite NHL-level player. And I, with Montreal being a terrible franchise, I think that he will get some playing time in the NHL just because of the fact that they have no depth and aren't very good. Um, so at least he should be able to get an opportunity that way, but it is what it is. Yeah, I, th- I think that every team, and I mean, we said this with Watherspoon. I think he's like a Tyler Watherspoon that way, that every team has a Brett Kulak. They have that guy who's 24, 25, who's on the cusp of maybe making the NHL but hasn't quite done so. And I think that, you know, somebody might be willing to try out this one over the one they have. But I, I don't expect Kulak to ever really hold down a full-time job anywhere besides a team like, say, Edmonton, who just has no defensemen. And it's like, hey, come here and play a couple of years just because we need a body. Well, hey, that's wrong. You know, Edmonton just traded one of their defensemen today, Jakob Yerebeck, for a six-round pick. They have so many that they're just getting rid of them left, right, and center. <laughs> well, or even a team like uh, Buffalo or uh, you know Phoenix, but just someone who kind of needs a defensive body. I can see that being where Kulak keeps his job in the NHL. Yeah. There's lots of jobs available for a guy like Kulak, but not one that like he'll hold down permanently. And with a potential expansion next year, we might also see him be a guy that you know might be brought into an organization like Seattle just to round out some depth. Well, the, the other big news from this week is not so much about guys departing, but two guys that Coach Bill Peters said would make the Calgary Flames team on opening day. We were kind of wondering what would happen. And Bill Peters announced this morning on Monday that Dylan Dubé and Yusuf Valamaki have both made the team to start. He made it clear that they might not be here all year, but they're here to start. Um, Matt, let's go through these one at a time. What are your thoughts on Dubé making the team? No, well, you and I, we had a conversation back when he had his hat trick during that game against the Oilers. I thought he was going to make the team. He's just a very smart player. And with players like him... Like most prospects, when they're 20 years old, they're poor defensively, or like there's certain holes in their game. But Dubé doesn't really have that those defensive lapses that most players his age have, and he's shown a lot, frankly. That and he is versatile in that he can play all three forward positions. So I think between all of those things and the fact that he is decent defensively, that he gets a shot where if he wasn't as polished defensively, I don't think he'd be in the NHL right now. I agree with that. I think the fact that he can play all three positions is a benefit here, and I really think that both these guys are here more to prove, I don't want to say fully, but partly to prove a point, to prove a point that, hey, if you look good and you come out and work hard, you're going to get a spot on this team. And I think with a new attitude and a new coaching staff, that was something they really had to show off early. Yeah, and he was a standout, frankly, for most of the camp. So (sighs) there's a good reason why he made the team. The other guy that we'll talk about here is Yusuf Valamaki. This will be his first pro season, and he's making the team right away. I think that Yusuf played really well, but I question this decision a little bit. Now, we haven't seen opening day rosters, but to me, I think that Rasmus Anderson looked ready last year and didn't get the shot, and I'm not sure how I feel with Yusuf kind of jumping over him in the depth chart to get the opening day slot. I would much rather have Raz on the opening day roster Yuso in Stockton, and then bring Yuso up when there's an injury. But what are your thoughts there? Well, I think this 
partially comes down to right hand, left hand. And Valimaki's a left handed defenseman, where Rasmus Anderson's a right handed defenseman. And Valimaki beat out Kulak, where Anderson would have had to beat out Stone. And I think that literally is the only reason why. Because you look at it, Anderson's a little more polished, but he's also a little slow with his skating. And I think that might be a problem for him moving forward um where Valimaki is a very quick defenseman and it'll be interesting to see I'd, I'm not sure that Valimaki stays for long I think he might be just getting a handful of games just to say here this is what the NHL is all about and then get sent down say in November sometime but we'll see like I, I'm I'm not overly surprised with that, but uh, it's because uh, he is a very good player. It's just we'll see. For sure, but it just feels like maybe he was prioritizing the depth chart. And you could be right; it could be the handedness thing because Bill Peters did say he likes Raz on the right, not so much on the left. But it just seems like Raz was kind of ready first and should maybe be brought up first. Well, you also want to kind of kick some players in the rear end once in a while to like hey you know you think that just because you got a low number that you you're being given a spot and maybe you should try a little harder and when you're in stockton to get back here and there will be a spot available to you if you do yeah, yeah, that could be part of it. Because um, motivation has been a little knows? bit of a issue with Anderson in the past, like with his weight and all yeah, that. Yeah, I think so. though, if you look at well, if you look at that journey, I mean, he was out of shape one off season, and now he's NHL ready. Like two years later, I think that shows a great change in his motivation. Yeah, just seeing that Kulak has been brought up on the left and. Anderson's not. It almost makes me think that there's another shoe that's about to drop here. I don't know. I just have this weird feeling. It's like, well, what are we going to do with Anderson? I don't think he benefits. He can benefit from a little bit more time in the A, but I don't think he benefits a whole lot from a whole nother year. So it kind of makes me wonder, hmm, is something going on here that we're just waiting to get done? Almost like uh, a stone being moved. Yeah, uh, that's a thing that I'm thinking that, especially with Zach Smith getting waived by Ottawa, and Ottawa having Stone's brother, it almost might make sense for a Stone for Smith plus whatever type of trade. Yeah, I don't know if we need another forward. I think if Smith comes in in, in here, then um, you know Dubé loses his spot. But we we could definitely move Stone. It's just it feels like in the you know the Western movies when the tumbleweed goes through town before something happens. It feels like that. It's like okay, hey, there's got to be a way to fit Raz in here, and I'm just not sure what it is, but looking at the blue line, maybe there's a deal for Stone in the works that we're not aware of. Yeah, uh, that's what I'm kind of thinking as well. It's, I think a lot of teams were just waiting till the end of training camp to see where their team's at, and hey, you guys still have Stone available. Well, hey, we're still interested, blah, 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 and see how yeah, that Yeah, the only bad thing about that is I would hate having a, a rookie third pairing i like the idea of one of them playing with stone but there's there's pros and cons both ways yeah true enough and i the only thing i'm hoping is that raz doesn't come up as the number seven i mean you know my thoughts on this i want guys to play and i'd rather raz goes to stockton and plays than stays here and sits in the press box yeah i think dalton prout is your number seven for the season and we'll just see like whichever young guy gets the job on a permanent basis. Yeah. But, you know, good for Valimaki for winning the job from Kulak. That's what we want to see from the young guys is forcing the Flames to make a move. And hopefully Raz can do the same and maybe there's another move to be made here. Yep. Then It's up to Rasmus Anderson to take a spot. It, he Stone is a good player. Not the best player in the world, by any stretch, but a serviceable third pairing defenseman, he has, has to simply be better than that. And if not, then have fun in Stockton and we'll see how things go later on. 
See, I just I don't think Raz is going to improve much more without playing in the NHL. And I don't think he can do much more to prove that he needs to be in uh, bottom, you know, pairing. I think he's pretty much proved that now. So I just I guess again from the point of view of looking at Raz, I think that he's pretty much done everything he can, and it's now a matter of the Flames just deciding what are we going to do there. I think if you leave him in the AHL too you're going to get him not wanting to come back to this organization and potentially when his contract's over, wanting to move on somewhere that's going to value him a bit more. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, I just, and I I mean, it's not even the start of the season yet, so I don't want to put too much stock in all this because we haven't even seen the opening day roster. But to me, they've, they have to do something with Stone in order to clear out their logjam of young defensemen. And even if that means waiting until November or December to do that, that's fine. But I don't think you can keep Raz just as the injury replacement guy like they did last year. So with all those moves in place, I mean, you and I are going to wait tomorrow to see what the lineups look like when they're announced by the Flames, both the lineups for the opener of the season, not the home opener, but the season opener in Vancouver, and also what the um, the lines themselves look like, not just the players that are here, but... Let's do some fantasy predictions. By the time the show comes out, we'll be able to see if we're right or not. Matt, why don't we go through this team line by line and guess who we think this, at least at the beginning of the season, what we're going to see on each line. Make sense? Sounds like a plan. Let's go. All right. Let's start with the top forward line. I'll give you mine. I think we're going to see uh, Goudreau, Monaghan, and Neal starting on the forward number one line. Going to argue with you there. I got a different player instead of Neal. Lindholm? Exactly. I, I, I see- think that there's a little bit more chemistry between Goudreau and Lindholm than there was with Neil, and I think that's going to be the difference right there. At the same time, if you remember this time last year, you and I went to some preseason games and said, wow, there's great chemistry between Goudreau and Bennett, and nothing happened there either. So, I don't know, we'll see. I, I think if you want Backlund and Kachuk to still be your defensive forwards, I think that... Neil's not as good a fit there, and I'm not sure how far you want to drop him down the lineup. True enough. But we'll we'll see. We'll see what happens. So I really debated the second line. I thought, do they start with the 3M line again? Kachuk, Backlund, Froelich. And I don't think it's going to happen. I think you get Kachuk, Backlund, and whichever right winger is not on the first line. So in my case, I'll go Lindholm. You're thinking that's going to be Kachuk, Backlund, Neil? Uh, Zarnik. Zarnik, wow. Yep. Okay. And Zarnik would be playing left wing on that line? Right wing uh, with Kachuk. On oh, right. The left, yeah, yeah, Kachuk's on the left. So what do, you, what do you like about that line? Why do you uh, think Zarnik that far up the lineup? I liked Zarnik's play. I think he's a very fast skater, and I think that he and Kachuk have a little bit of chemistry going, and I think that but with his speed, he'll help on the defensive side of it as well because of the fact that he can – go and attack and then get back in time as well. And I think that Frolik could be utilized elsewhere and I think that he'll be on a different line that would more suit him. But I I think that Neil uh, doesn't really fit on that line. No, I agree. So, So you're thinking Neil will fall even further to the third or fourth line? Yep. Wow. Okay, well, let's talk the third line. On the third line, I had, um, and I've sort of gone back and forth on this, whether I'm going to have Bennett, Jankowski, and Froelich, or Zarnik, Jankowski, and Froelich, but I still think that the Flames are going to at least start the season with the Jankowski-Bennett pairing, because I think those two worked pretty well last year. They just need some consistency on their wings. So I think if you put Bennett, Jankowski, and Froelich together, you'll have a decent third line there, and I think Froelich will bring some defensive responsibility to those two that they might need. Yeah, and I'm going to go with a completely different third line, which probably sure. will be a variation of your fourth line, uh, with Dubé, Ryan, and Neil. The only worry I have with a guy like Neil on the third line is now we're getting into a Brower-like scenario where we got the, a lot of money tied up in the bottom six. Well, I the, that's the thing. I don't view... I view Calgary as having as one first line and then three second lines. I don't view it as a second, third, and fourth line. And so uh, it, I think that you might end up seeing the, at least five on five, that like the second, third, and fourth line getting basically the same amount of minutes. See, I think if you don't have Neil on line one, you put him there on the power play. 
Oh yeah, for sure. That's a whole different story. On yeah. power play one, Neil's right there. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's interesting, and I guess it's one of these things that we have so much depth that you can mix and match these lines so many different ways. It's kind of exciting this year. Oh, I know. It's not well. These all these top nine guys are penciled in in stone from day one, and then well, whatever's left on the fourth. You're line. not penciled in in stone. That's like writing in a pen, then. Yeah. Um, and then my fourth line I have to start with, anyways, is. I think Zarnik and Ryan are going to be good together, and I would throw Dubé on there. I think that Dubé, at least to get started, go with those guys. Again, whatever the breakdown of minutes is, I'm not sure, but I like that combination of Zarnik, Ryan, and Dubé. Yeah, that works, too. I, 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 if that was the the line, that would be fine. I, 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 also th- I also think in that case it gives Dubé a great uh, setup man in Ryan. Mm-hmm. And Zarnik, frankly. They're both very good shooters, so that could work. Uh, for me, the fourth line would be Bennett, Jankowski, and Froelich. Interesting. Which, so you're almost it, demoting Jankowski and Bennett. Well, I actually, I really don't view... Like, under normal circumstances, like, oh, that's the fourth line. They suck. But, uh, frankly, I view it as the Flames have three second lines. So I don't really okay. view any of them as being particularly bad or good. It's... Well, the nice thing about having kind of three second lines is you could really change the minutes each one plays every period. You could give, say, line two most of the minutes in first period and then the third line most of the minutes in the second period and the fourth line most of the minutes in the third period. Yeah, it just depends on who's hot. And, like, if, say, Kachuk's line has it that night, give them a couple minutes extra. And it just depends on which line has it. And you can mix and match and if chemistry isn't working you have nine solid second third fourth line guys that can all intermix with each other on each line and have a quality line like you could put kachuk out there with say ryan and neil and that'd be perfectly fine too like there's so many different options where like last year uh, you know there was no options really it was this is when i said give them the most time sorry i meant behind the first line yeah of course yeah, no, and I see where you're going with the options, and again, I think we have to be careful because if you mix and match too much, then guys don't get used to their play partners and you don't get that chemistry, but I think it opens up a lot of possibilities for in the case of an injury, or it opens up a lot of possibilities in the case of uh, special teams, but I don't want to see them just jumble around those bottom nine too much. I think that's really going to really affect the team and the way it plays. Well, the thing is, is that with um, how the team has kind of worked itself out, that there's more just pairings. Like, you have Kachuk and Backlund, Bennett and Jankowski. I think that with that, you'll end up keeping those guys together and then just slot the other five forwards around wherever it seems to work. Yeah, and we did that last year, but then, of course, we didn't touch the 3M line. So I think you'll start by moving the rest around. And I think as you start to say, okay, these guys work really well, then you kind of lock that one in. Yeah. And with so much roster turnover, you kind of need to give them 20 games just to figure out what chemistry works, period. And then... I think we're a little further ahead than that because of how long the preseason was for these guys. Oh, I agree. It, but it'll still take a little while just to sort everything out. Because, like, say uh, one pairing has a one specific good game. Well, that's good. They had the one good game. But is that an actual thing, or were they just clicking that night? And For sure. Those, I, I those don't kind know we're going to 20 games like usual. Yeah. We'll see. The one thing is for certain, the Flames need to get off to a good start this year because... Yeah, you know, like every year for the last 25 years, it's, you know, they kind of shoot themselves in the foot early and then have to fight their way after that. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the rest of this roster. So who do you think the extra forward or forwards will be? Uh, Hathaway and Peluso. So you think your boy Hathaway doesn't crack the starting lineup? No, but I think that, like, if uh, the team needs... Uh, bit more physical presence than whichever struggling forward gets taken out and he gets put in and uh peluso in in case of team with dirt bags 
that needs some phases punched, then, you know, Peluso's there. I think it's going to be Hathaway and Lazar as the bottom two, at least to start with. I'm not sure they send Lazar to the HL right away. They've got, what, 30 days to do it now or 10 games. Um, I think that I think they might look at Lazar and say, you know what, he's a good enough option. Let's leave him here for now until somebody else proves themselves. Yeah, it depends on, like, if they don't view Lazar as being able to put himself back together. Like, if this is what Lazar is, then I think they'll keep him up here. But if they think that there's more there, that he's just got to figure the, his own game out, then I think he'll go back to Stockton for a bit. And honestly, I think that we've probably seen Lazar at his, I guess, his peak. And I think he's worth keeping here to play the odd, you know, game when someone's injured. I think he can do that well. But I don't know we get a lot of value from him going to Stockton at this point. I think he's more valuable keeping here as a guy to slot in the lineup to play some hockey. Yeah. Oh. Well, let's move to the blue line. Uh, we have three pairings there and potentially some extra defensemen. I'll start with my first pairing. We're probably going to agree here. I think you have Giordano and Brody as the first pairing. Oh, I was going to say Prot and Valimaki, but, you know, gee. <laughs> Are we watching the same game here? Are we going for the first round, first pick in the lottery? Well, I think Vancouver and Colorado have that locked up. We'll find out. Edmonton's usually right around there, too. Yeah. Um, so I think Giordano, I mean, we've already heard the coach talk about wanting to put those guys together. That's not going to be a surprise. I think, honestly, as we're talking about this pairing... It seems like every couple of years we get a big Giordano injury. And just looking at the timeline, it's almost like we're due for one again. Knock on wood. Um, I hope we don't, but I just feel like this pairing will last part of the year, but not all the way through. I could see that. And I think that partially might be why Valimaki is getting a shot early. Because he would need to slot into Hannafin's spot on the second pairing if... Giordano goes down and so if he gets some of the rough edges worked on early if Giordano goes down then you're, you're not just kind of throwing him to the wolves yeah that definitely could be um let's move on to the second pairing again I think we'll agree here Hamannick and Hannafin yep the ha ha you're not gonna pairing. try and put Proud in here again no the 2H pairing and then I think we all agree on the third pair as well, which is going to be Stone Valimaki at least to start with. Yep. And Prout, number seven. Yeah, I think they only carry one extra defenseman just like they did last year, and I think Prout is... It's interesting because Prout came in last year. We all thought that he'd be in the NHL, and uh, Bartkowski wouldn't. He went to the AHL, and now I think, you know, looking at that, Prout's probably the best choice that we have right now, unless they bring in one of the new guys from Montreal in that spot instead. But I think Prout's probably the best choice for the number seven, no question. Yep, and he's a player sort of he's like Derek a- England who can slot in as a number seven, play a decent, like, ten minutes, and be fine. Not going to blow you away. If there's a big injury, I don't want Prout to be playing you know, more than he needs to. I think it's almost like Bartkowski where you play him on a back-to-back because you can't get a guy here in time. But I think if there's a, you know, a... 5, 10, 15 game injury you call up either Raz or Shillington. Yep, I agree. And then goaltending. We know who the starter is. The starter once again is going to be number 41, Mike Smith. Who do you think backs him up? Uh, David Riddick to start the year. And uh, like, I'm slightly concerned with the goaltending but I'm also not really concerned with the goaltending. Like, just going back in years, like usually, like Kipper was usually terrible when the during the preseason, and then was fine when the regular season started. Smith was horrible last preseason, was perfectly fine up until his injury. So, like, I'm not really overly concerned. I think that everybody was just kind of treating it as a way to get a little loose so that way when the games actually mattered they could try without hurting themselves 
Yeah, I, I think some people misunderstood my concerns from last week when I was talking about bringing in a free agent goalie. I'm not concerned about the goaltending position at all if Smith stays healthy. I think that Riddick is just fine to play, what, 10, 15 games a year, all the back-to-backs, couple games against terrible teams. I have no problem with that. Where my concern comes in is, I believe, not if but when Smitty gets hurt, that I don't think that Riddick can cover that time as the starting workload. So that's where my concerns were last week. Maybe I didn't articulate that properly, but I wouldn't go out and get a Mason or a Lettinen just to sit on the bench and play 20 games. But to me, it becomes the insurance policy for when, I believe when, not if Smitty goes down this year for an extended period of time. Now, here's a question for you. Uh, Calvin Pickard uh, was waived by the Maple Leafs today. Yay or nay? I think Pickard is a lateral move at this point. I don't know that, again, I would want... I don't feel comfortable with Pickard having that... Let's say it's a month that Smith is out, just for the sake of argument. I don't feel that Pickard gives us a better starting goalie for a month than Riddick does. Huh. What about you? I'm kind of on the fence with that. Uh, I think Riddick could be better than what he's shown. It, it, put it this way, if Calgary ends up claiming Pickard, it'd be like, oh, that's a decent move. If they don't, hey, that's a decent move too. So it it's one of those where, uh, it yeah, it's okay either way, frankly. The only issue I have with claiming Pickard at this point is now you've got three goaltenders who are going to have to find AHL time. So I think if you claim Pickard, you've almost got to move Riddick out of the organization at that point. Yeah. You know, and we were talking about potential deals earlier. I mean, maybe Stone and Riddick get paired up, but I don't want to have a three-goalie system in in the AHL because nobody's going to develop then, trying to find time for all those guys. True. And we can't send Parsons back to the ECHL this year because th- then we got to find a spot for Nick Schneider. Like, I think at this point, if you're going to add a goalie, you have to subtract a goalie. Yep. Can't argue so, with you there. And, I'm, and I don't know that adding Pickard and subtracting Riddick in the long term gets you much. Yeah. It's kind of like shuffling deck chairs for no reason. Pretty much. And if, if that's the case, I would almost rather give Gillies a chance than bring in a new goalie and have to move one out. Yep. So I, I definitely agree, though. I think that uh, Riddick is the backup. I think, again, he's a capable backup. But I just I worry about if we have to cover the spread of starting time. And, yeah, we could trade for a guy, but now we got to give up an asset. And that kind of worries me, too, because goalies aren't cheap to acquire. Well, I think if Smith goes down, then you're going to see a three-goalie rotation, whichever guy earns the starting spot and, like, some demotions and all that kind of crap later on. But I think all of Parsons, Gillies, and Riddick will be given a shot. Probably Riddick first, then Gillies, then Parsons, if the neither of the other two take the ball and run with it. Well, that's the thing with young goalies. You just never know which one's going to take the ball and run with it. So if there an opportunity presents itself, you'll just have to wait and see which one, if any, goes ahead with it. Yeah, I think for me the big question with Parsons is we all like him. He looks good, but he even struggled when he got called up to the AHL last year. So I don't necessarily want to bring him all the way up to the NHL yet. I think this is a kid who has to put in some time at the AHL level, really establish himself there, and let the other two guys fight for the NHL spot. So as the Calgary Flames mark their 38th season and 39 years in the NHL with the 2018-2019 campaign underway, it's time for us to do as we always do this time of year, and that's to start making some predictions. Um, Looking ahead, no season games have been played yet, so for all we know, these could be wrong as of Wednesday, one of these, but let's go through. Some of these are the same as always. Some of them are new. Matt, we'll go through these. We'll each give our answer. I'm going to record these answers, and then we'll look at it at the end of 2018 and again at the end of the season to see how wrong we were. First question for you. Who do you think is going to have a breakout season this year? Austin Zarnick. Yeah, you think he's the man? I think he'll put up 25 goals. Okay, interesting. Remember this time last year, it was the coaches saying that Bennett was going to have a breakout season? Yeah, I know. And that never happened. 
Um, I'm going to go differently. I think that Jankowski is going to be the guy. Yeah. I think that Zarnik's definitely going to look good, but I think that Mark Jankowski is going to prove that he shouldn't be a fourth-line centerman. Come out and probably put up, I'd say, about the same. I, th- I actually think Zarnik, while he can do the goals, is going to end up getting a lot more assists than goals. And I think this will be the year that we see uh, that we see uh, Mark break out. I can see that too. Let's go the opposite way. Who do you think is going to struggle this year? I'm going to go with James Neal. James Neal, and what do you think his struggles are going to be? Uh, I think he'll be expected to score more than he actually does. I think he'll probably only put up about 18, 20 goals this year. And I think that he'll just have a little bit of a hard time fitting in. Um, I'm not sure. Like, he's a good player. I just don't know. Because his foot speed seems a little slow. I'm having a hard time seeing where he fits in on five on five. Like, on the power play, that's where he'll get most of his points. But I don't see enough there and it might just be preseason not you know and he did go to the finals twice in a row well that's what i was about to say this guy's played a lot of hockey so i can see if he's kind of coasting through the preseason at this point i'm gonna actually go a little bit off the board here i think i'm gonna go with michael froleek i think that froleek really got into his stride and maybe looked better than he should have playing on the 3m line I think he's going to get lost in the lineup a little bit. I think he'll jump from line to line, and I don't know that Froelich is going to look as good this year. I think that he will be a guy who might be like the next stage in this time, you know, by January. We're going, we're paying this guy to do what? How much? Yeah, probably. And I think that was kind of expected when we signed him, that the back half of the contract would look a little on the iffy, iffy side. For sure. But I think that he, I think we're getting more out of him on the 3M line than we should have. And now that we've, you know, really beefed up that right wing spot, I just think that he's not going to look as good. I agree. But I think he'll still be a valuable penalty killer depth guy, and that'll help. Yeah, I I think you're probably right there. I think he'll start as the penalty kill guy, but I can honestly some, see somebody else like uh, Ryan take that spot. We'll see. Um, will Mike Smith be able to stay healthy this year? And by let's qualify this as saying not be out for more than what a week, two weeks? Uh, probably not. I, no, I think that he'll probably get hurt at some point for a little while, maybe a month or so, if that. Hopefully, it's nothing major, but I'm not confident that he'll be able to be consistently healthy throughout the whole season. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I think that he's going to get hurt. Hopefully, I'd almost rather have it sooner rather than later so we can get him hurt, get him back, and be ready for a playoff push. I think that's part of what hurt the Flames last year is just how late in the season it happened. Yeah, well, that was like everything that could go wrong went wrong all at the same time. So it, that's why why the Flames season kind of went off the rails. On that question, and I won't record this, but uh, do you think Mike Smith resigns here at the end of the year? No, not at all. No, I, I think that after, especially if he gets hurt this year, I think that he's probably he might get a backup job somewhere, not here, but I think that his starter days are done after this. I agree. Um, who do you think will be the first call up, both on forward and D? Uh, first call up on D, I'll go with Rasmus Anderson uh, for forward. It depends really on uh, which position uh, the player gets hurt. I would expect that, like, if it's a winger, Manjapane uh, or Lazar, if he gets sent down, would be uh, the guy that would get the call. Okay, so then they're going to go with one of the young guys. Yeah, and with the center, I think that it, I think that the Flames would just like convert one of the wingers that it could be a center to being a center. And call one of the wingers up. So, like, say you have Dubé playing on the wing, and say Ryan gets hurt, then I think that Dubé would slot in Ryan's spot, and one of the other players would come up. Makes sense. So you're thinking Manji Pani? Is that who you want me to put down? Yeah, sure. I'm going to go a little bit differently. I think that just because he's older, I think the Flames will bring Klimchuk up first, especially if it's a shorter-term injury, just because I think you've got to really – work this guy out at the NHL level to see if he's worth keeping around or not. I can see that too. 
And uh, and I think Mangiapane is going to get more out of um, staying in the AHL and playing top minutes there, especially if he's working with a guy like Lazar, that if you bring him up to the NHL, you can ruin that flow. I agree. So I was going to say Quine or Robinson, but I don't think we see those guys again. And if we do, it means we got some issues. Yeah, I think if you see those guys, we have like three or four injuries at the same time. Yeah. Really, that would make a decent fourth line, probably better than the one that we had last season. So, But I think at that point, if that's your fourth line, it changes the identity of this team. Oh, now for you're sure. you have a grinding sandpaper line, and I don't know that you can go from our what would be our top nine to that and have any success with that kind of line. No, it'll be a weird makeup if we do run into that kind of injury troubles. But again, you know, some great veteran forwards for Stockton. I actually, looking at how many vets are on this Stockton team, I mean, they can only play, what, six in a game? But this could be a team that's contending for the uh, the Calder Trophy this year. I wouldn't be surprised. I think that, uh, I think with how the... Calder the, Cup or whatever it is. Yeah, that with uh, the, the Heat not making the playoffs or being bounced in the first round, I think that's irked the organization a bit. And... Um, I think that having a lot of veteran guys like Taormina, who was acquired today, there would help. Yeah, well, like I mentioned earlier with Taormina, I think if you bring a guy up, like the last couple of years, they've really decimated the farm late when they've had to make a lot of call-ups. And I think this year you've got those veteran guys there that can step in when you're making, you know, a, a Klimchuk or Mangiapane call-up. Or if you got a call-up, like you said, three of them, you've still got enough vets to hold the fort. But for those that don't know, there is a limit to how many guys over... I think it's five guys over 260 pro games can be in your lineup at any time. You can have as many as you want on the roster. You just can't dress. I believe it's four or five. But I'd have to look it up. Um, who do you think will be the first player on the Calgary Flames roster right now to get traded this year, if anybody? Uh, first guy to get traded... I'm not really sure that the Flames will make any... Like, for their pro team, I don't think that they'll be shipping anybody out. Other than Stone, I guess. There, I'll go with him. I was going to go Stone, but I'm going to make a bit of a different prediction here. And this is something I've been talking to you about and I mentioned on the show. I think the biggest Flames trade ship they might have would be uh, Sam Bennett at the deadline. I don't see Bennett getting a lot better. And he's still on a good contract. I can see there being a GM who'd want to take him on and try to, you know, it's almost like Pavel Brendel, right? He's a top pick. Enough teams want him because they thought they could do something with him. I think you might have somebody take on Bennett thing and they can find the diamond in the rough there. Yeah, I think that Bennett will have a better season this year. I think he'll start to reach his potential a bit. I think he'll have his best offensive season, but not by a huge amount. Yeah, I I think he'll have a better season, but I just don't think he comes anywhere near what the expectations were, and I almost feel like with his contract expiring, it's time to cut bait on that. I don't. If he doesn't. No? No, I'd keep him. He plays a decent game overall. Uh, With players like Bennett, sometimes it takes a while for them to adapt to the NHL, and he can put up 20 goals. And 40 points, that kind of player, while being a depth piece. And he has a lot of skill. It's just he hasn't really been able to put all the parts together. And, you know, you don't want to trade that and then have him be the star player of whichever team you traded him to. So I'd I'd be more likely to give him a lot more opportunities because what you're going to get in return for him is basically nothing. Like you're gonna, you might get a second round pick out of them. Yeah, and, and like that's oh that's and, okay, but uh, the upside if Bennett actually does figure it out, you've got a high quality top six forward. Where that's true, a second round pick, the odds of that happening are like zero. So the only worry I would have about calling him a potential top six is if you look at the top six on this team, I also think he's got to pass a lot of guys to become a top six here. Oh yeah, I agree. But it would be a feasibility if he does turn out because he can be a center. He can be a right winger. So, you know, it's one of those things that he might just have to play a different position than, yeah, maybe 
we'll see. You know, it, with a lot of young guys, it takes a while for them to figure it out. Other guys like Kachuk just and Monahan just step in and hey, I'm awesome right from day one. Just depends. I. Th- yeah, no, that's true. And even, even I mean, uh, you know, a guy like Backlund, right? He had to really change his game, I think, to become what he is now. He came in as that first line, that first round pick. Everybody thought he was going to be the first line sniping center, and he's really found over the years that he's he plays a different role on this team. And maybe that's what Bennett has to do first. Uh-huh. The other guy who's going to put in here, and I, I know you've got Stone. I think in the end, Stone for. Some draft pick will be what happens. I don't know if they'll bring in another body because this team needs to recoup some picks. But the other way I was going to go, if not Bennett, was Froelich. I think that, again, that's a chip that the Flames have that they would be willing to part with if they needed to. He's an expensive chip here to be a bottom six guy. And I could see them, say, moving out Froelich to bring up a Mangiapane or, you know, one of the young guys. And I think there could be some value. I would say no more than a second rounder. But if you can flip Froelich for a second, that might be worth doing at the deadline. Yeah, well, it, it, yeah, that's possible. It's it's not a bad contract. I can see there though being a strategic advantage to keep that contract if we're going to get expansion next year because I could see that contract being a lucrative one for Seattle to take. I agree. So I think a lot of that depends on if there's going to be expansion next year or not. If there is, I think Froelich stays. If not, I can see them trying to do a deal for Froelich for a draft pick or two. Uh-huh. Um, we, we, you and I do this every year, but what do the Flames have to do to be successful this season? When we look back, what is our success metric? Uh, they have to be in a dogfight with San Jose for the division title all year long and hopefully be on the better side of that. Anything less than that, like if they're the third in a division or one of the wild card teams, I don't feel that. Uh, that, to me, is a failure. Really? Yep. This is from the same guy who thought that we were a Stanley Cup team last year. So Yeah, well, Yager and Versteeg were supposed to actually be partial contributors to the team, and they didn't do anything. So, you know, I was penciling them in to be like a 30-point guy for Versteeg and a 40- to 50-point guy for Yager, and they got, I think, 13 points out of the two of them. So yeah, very injury prone. Yeah, you know, and then none of the other players stepped up. So yeah, it was just one of those where everything went wrong. But now the Flames actually have depth at all positions, so they really don't have any excuse for not being one of the top teams. For me, the the uh, success metric this year is that the Flames have to. I think they have to win the second round of the playoffs. I don't think they have to necessarily go all the way to the cup, but I think that this is a team that's often able to get to round two and then lose or not get past round one. I think if you're really trying to show the fan base that you're better, you've got to win two rounds. I don't really care where they finish in the regular season as long as they can win two rounds. I agree. If they're not representing the Pacific Division in the Western Conference Finals, then... I think that they need to do some more work. Probably, yeah, I mean, uh, I, probably at that rate, another goaltender and probably another defenseman. But we'll see. Well, and, and and I'm almost starting to feel like if they can't do it this year, I don't know that just a few more tweaks is going to do it. I think at some point you've got to start looking at what else is going on here. We can't fire another coach. We can't. Like I just don't think that this team can afford another disappointment after last season. No. Last year was a complete and total embarrassment for the organization. So if they don't go out and prove themselves, then, yeah, some changes will need to be made. And I'll just put a little bit of an addendum to this. Not that it has to happen, but I would love if they beat the Ducks in one of those rounds. I don't see the Anaheim Ducks even coming close to the playoffs, so... We'll talk when we get to looking at the Pacific Division, but I, I think the Ducks might sneak in. Yeah. Um, well, why don't we do that? Let's talk a little bit about the Pacific Division. The For those that don't remember, Anaheim, Arizona, Calgary, Edmonton, L.A., San Jose, Vancouver, and Vegas are uh, the teams that make up the Pacific Division. So three of them will make it in, and potentially one is a wild card. Um, Matt, let's start with the Flames angle on this. Where do you think the Flames finish in the Pacific? If the goaltending is good, first. If not, second or third. 
So really, even if the goaltending is not good, you think that they're pretty close to the top? Yeah, it, they have the depth where, like, if, if they're getting adequate goaltending, then they will still be a playoff team. It's just, it, they'd have to have basically, like, Jonas Hiller level goaltending to miss the playoffs. It's funny when you say Jonas Hiller level, because earlier we were talking about guys on waivers, and I've heard some talk of bringing back one of the guys I think is the worst Flames goal in recent memory, which is McElhaney. Yeah. McElhaney, he was bad when he was with us, but he got better. And is a sur- he's sort of like Jamie McLennan. You know, just that serviceable backup. He won't do anything great, but he's there, and he'll stop some pucks. And, and they both have great nicknames. Yeah. So if you think the Flames are going to be, uh, in your case, number one, I'm going to say I don't think that they're going to beat San Jose this year. I think San Jose's going to be untouchable. Um, I just think that everything's going to go. They need a season for everything to go right, and I just have a feeling that with the Carlson deal, everything's going to go right for them. They're not going to choke in the playoffs like they usually do. I think Calgary's going to be second. If they don't get good goaltending, I think third, but I'm penciling them in for second in the one in the yeah, Pacific. Yeah, I'd agree with you there. I'll go with second just you know because of the volatility of the goaltending. I think really if they're going to beat San Jose, then San Jose's really had something go bad. Like they're just they're built as a I think an overall better team than Calgary. I disagree, but I think it, they have less uh, holes. I think Calgary has a better top six, but I think there's less holes throughout San Jose's lineup and guys that I think can fill a bit better. Well, actually, I think it's the exact opposite. I think they have more star power and then l- no depth. So interesting. Yeah. See, but, but I just think I think because they have so much star power, they're going to spread them out among the lineup and therefore sort of dilute their forward core. But we'll find yeah. out. And we'll see how Carlson and Carlson, it sounds like a law firm, Carlson and Carlson do on the back end. Yeah. One is good, one is not. Maybe you can confuse the two. Yeah. If I'm the no good Carlson, I use that to pick up ladies at the bar. I'm the other Carlson. Um, So let's look at this division, Matt. Who do you think besides, I think we both agree, Calgary and San Jose, who else do you think in the Pacific makes the playoffs? Vegas and L.A. Interesting. So you think, and who do you think's the wild card? Uh, L.A. L.A. You think so? You think it's Calgary, Vegas, and San Jose for the West? Yeah. In that case, I think it is Calgary number two. I don't think Vegas is built well enough to beat Calgary this year. Yeah, I agree. I think L.A. because they L.A. has a lot of older players, and I, they're all very good, mind you. But I I think that they they'll start to be. Showing a little bit of their age, and yeah, I think they're going down a bit. See, I think that Anaheim's the same way. I think Anaheim's got age. They're starting to decline, but I don't know. The Ducks always find a way, and I'm thinking that they might have enough in the tank to get one more year out of this core. I think that they're, they can do it and do one more season, but then I think they're done. So I think it's going to be Anaheim over L.A. It'll be hard without Perry and Kessler for a long time. It will, but I don't know. I, I have a feeling that somebody's going to step up because he's out for, what, five months? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think that's the big question is if someone can step up to replace you know, the injured, the injuries there, then they'll do okay. If not, then they're going to stumble. Yeah. Who do you who do you think is the worst team in the Pacific? Vancouver. I think they're the worst. Them and Ottawa are going to be trading blows for who's the worst team in the league. You see, then they're going to be worse than Edmonton. Oh, the, they're going to be terrible. They were terrible last huh. year, and then they lost their two best players and didn't replace them with anything. So yeah, that's true. I think yeah, and that's you, true. And they <laughs> they have some good rookies, or I guess not rookies now, rookies last year. But they've got nothing around them. It's like Connor McDavid and Edmonton. They got two pieces, but nothing around them. Yeah, and the rest of it's just kind of mediocre crap. And yeah, it's going to be a really long season for the Canucks. Which you know I think is good for the Flames in a lot of ways because of the rivalry there. I think that we'll be able to steal some easy wins from them. Hopefully, too, in the first week. That would be nice, because usually this team's getting started crappy. As for the other three teams, I think that the division standings will go San Jose, Calgary, Vegas, L.A., Arizona, 
Anaheim, Edmonton, and then Vancouver. Wow, you think Anaheim falls that far? Yeah. Interesting. See, I think Anaheim and Arizona, I, I think, think are on th- opposite ends. I think the Ducks have one season left in their tank, and I think Arizona's one season from getting good. Yeah. I think Arizona, I think both Arizona and Anaheim finish around the 80-point mark. Like, plus or minus five. Okay. Interesting. I think Edmonton's, like, more in the 70 point range or lower <laughs> if Talbot gets hurt and yeah uh, Vancouver like maybe 55 I think the big story in the Pacific Division this year might be how much Anaheim's able to sell for a reasonable price well if Anaheim was smart they'd basically be having a yard sale anything that's you know not broken is yours <laughs> And comes with an old Ducks logo. Yes. Um, the only thing there is they're celebrating, what, their 25th anniversary this year, the Ducks, and I think that marketing-wise, they might not want to rebuild in their 25th year, but I think if they can yeah. admit that they're... If they, if they can admit they have to rebuild, I think they could get a lot of value from some of their pieces. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like They could get multiple firsts for Getzlaff if they wanted to. Yeah, well, that would be a. I think that could honestly, the moving of Getzlaff could steal the deadline this year. Yeah, that's my early prediction. Yeah, uh, frankly, I like the Ducks. They need to, you know, not have a third jersey that looks like the Sharks with the Ducks logo on it. Um, but the, they really do need to rebuild. Like they do have a lot of good young parts, like the Lindholm, and. Uh, uh, like a whole bunch of the guys that frankly Raquel and all that it, it's just that they need to get more young guys in there and they just don't really have a ton of organizational depth prospect wise see what happens with them yeah. um and the last question how far do you think the flames go in the playoffs well f- frankly I, I think that it I'll just uh say like what I feel that the playoffs will end up being is uh toronto versus boston in their division with uh toronto going to the conference finals uh probably pittsburgh versus columbus in their division with pittsburgh going to the conference finals and pittsburgh beating toronto to go to the stanley cup and that's in the east yeah and in the other division i'm gonna say nashville versus winnipeg in, That'd be a good series to watch. And with Winnipeg once again beating the Predators to go to the conference finals. And Calgary beating San Jose in round two to go to the conference finals where we get spanked by the Jets. And then the Jets win the Stanley Cup. So you think the Flames go pretty much to the third round? Yeah. I'm going to agree with you. I had written down here for your prediction, third round or bust. Like I said, I don't think we have to win the third round, but I think in order to show success, the Flames have to appear in that third round. Yeah. I think if this team doesn't even make the playoffs, then we have to... Uh, fire the GM and, like, every... You know, get different people. Like, if the Flames miss the playoffs again, like, it's, something's gone drastically wrong and stuff needs to be figured out. Uh, and I think if the Flames aren't in a playoff spot by the deadline, you sell everything. Oh, yeah, for sure. If it's not you know, stapled G- down, go. Everything. Giordano. You know, Gir- Giordano, Brody. Um, well, I'd keep Brody. I'd trade Stone, Hanif- or Hamannick, uh like any of the veteran guys. That- See, if to me, if I'm the Flames and I'm not in a playoff spot by the deadline, I would seriously move in Goudreau. I'd consider it because you've got Kachuk right behind him, and I think you'd get a King's Ransom to help you reboot your... your yeah, re- I, wouldn't go, I wouldn't go to that extent yet. But like, we'll see. It. Yeah. I don't want him to be like Jerome where we trade him when there's no value left. Yeah. Well, I think that it's very much too early for that. I think that if the Flames do screw up to the point where the, like you're trading selling off players like you just sell the vets off first and then go from there and the last question i'll ask you do you see either in in let's say an ideal what do you think is going to happen this season do you see the coach and the gm both still being employed by this team at the end of the year if the flames make the playoffs yes if they don't no 
Who do you think lose their job if not? Troll Living. Yeah, I don't think you can switch Peters again. No. I think, And Peters, I think, would stay for another year or two. Sort of like Hartley when Troll Living came aboard. Stayed for a bit, and then Troll Living got his own guy, and I think that's kind of the same concept. Well, Matt, that just about wraps it up, but as we always do, we should give our predictions for the week. We'll be back after the first two games. The Flames play a home-and-home -home series against Vancouver. They open the season on Wednesday the 3rd at 8 p.m. Mountain in Vancouver. Then they get a couple days off and come back on the 6th for the home opener. If you've never been to a home opener, try to get tickets to that game. It's a lot of fun. It's a big show they put on. You want If you're a Flames fan, you've never done it. It should be on your bucket list. So, Matt, two games against Vancouver. Last year we started terribly against Edmonton. Or, no, two years ago we started terribly against Edmonton. Last year we didn't start great. What do you think the start of the season is going to be, those first two games? Frankly, because their opponent is Vancouver for both games, and Vancouver is supposed to be one of the worst teams in the league, walking away with anything less than four points is not really an option. Remember two you two years ago, what was it? Yeah, two years ago, uh, Edmonton spanked us like what nine to four or something in the first game. Yeah, it was some ridiculous score. And let me go back. Last year they lost the home three the season zero. opener three zero, and then beat Winnipeg six to three. The year before in October, let me just load it on NHL dot com here. That was the year we were all gung ho, and it's like shit. We can't beat Edmonton. We got to rethink this whole thing. So you think f four points on the board, Calgary takes all four? They need to. Vancouver is terrible. Uh, like At worst, like one of the games could go to overtime, but Calgary would have to win it. Like, that's... And, you, you know, like you just can't lose to Vancouver. Like, come on. Uh, they're that bad. <laughs> I, I have a feeling Vancouver might squeak out a win in the home opener just because of all the excitement around it. I think if they do, it'll be an overtime win, so I think Calgary gets one there. And I want to see Calgary win the home opener... So I'm going to say three points on the week. Uh, I think I think it would be – I can see Vancouver going to either overtime or a shootout in that first one. I think they've got enough muscle if they want to to come out strong. Yeah. I don't think they'll last, but – Yeah. Well, the team needs – like especially because this first month of the season, they play five tough games after the Vancouver's pair, and then it's like alternating a couple games against – bad teams then good teams and then bad teams and then good teams so like two or three against each so it, it's important for them to get four points because they have five games against tough teams and you know that it, those are always harder to get points out of well let's just look ahead on the schedule there so we have the two vancouver games then the flames spend a whole week on the road which is uncommon to start the season on the second week of the season they play the ninth in nashville the 11th in st louis and the 13th in colorado then they come home to play boston and nashville on the 17th and 19th back on the road against new york and montreal back at home for pittsburgh washington back on the road for their first back-to-back -back of the season which is toronto buffalo so it's i think it's a good month to prove yourself there's going to be games that are going to be tough and we'll see how this team can respond and there's games we should win like montreal Vancouver, no problem. Yeah, exactly. And the, like even the Buffalo game, they should win. So like they, there's some games that are going to be easier. Like the Rangers game is going to be easier. Colorado, uh, not really. They're they're a little better now. So like it, it, there's going to be some tough games, but a lot of easier ones. They just gotta hold their own for a bit. Like next month yeah. is not too bad. Like they kind of go through a bunch of mediocre teams next month, so hopefully it works. I think it's kind of nice to have the schedule we do for October because it gives those Flames a chance to play with some different line combos and have some games where they can really test them and some games where maybe they can experiment a bit more. Mm -hmm. It'll be nice to see some actual NHL hockey, though, and looking forward to another great season of Flames hockey. And just to let everybody know before we go, if you take a look at the schedule, Mondays is the game, the day the Flames play the least, so that's the day we'll be recording, and we'll be trying to put out the episodes every week on Tuesday night or early Wednesdays. So that's going to be our schedule for the majority of the the season. Yep. That Matt, enjoy this home and home series. Thank you for listening, everybody, and as always, go Flames, go! Let's get this off on the right start, guys. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson. 
co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.